OK, let's talk about these questions. Number one, three parts. First part, what is the central conceit, the central idea or the central image? So there is a flea, right? Line one, mark but this flea. Mark means pay attention to, notice. Uh, but means only. So look only at this flea and mark in this and, and pay attention to this. How little that which thou deniest me is. That which thou deniest me, the thing that you refuse me. Look at how little it is, how unimportant it is. Me it sucked first and now sucks thee, the, the blood. And in this flea are two bloods mingled be. So the main verb should be here. Uh, in this flea is our two bloods mingled. So your blood is in here and my blood is in here. Thou knows that this cannot be said a sin or shame or loss of maidenhead. So you know that this situation does not mean that you have sinned. It does not mean you have shame. Does not mean you have lost your virginity. Yet this enjoys before it woo. Woo here means pursue, like pursuing a lover. So this flea could mix our blood before it tried to pursue you. So like the order is reversed. Usually if you want to have sex with someone, you would first try to pursue them uh, and like let, make them want to have sex with you before you actually have sex with them. So this order is reversed. Uh, and then this line nine and this Alas, alas is like unfortunately, Kushi, is more than we would do. So our blood is mingled in the flea, but you would not mingle your blood with me in real life. Like you, you do not want to have sex with me. So that's the main conceit. The idea that uh, our blood is mingled in the flea, so it's like we already had sex. Do you think it makes sense? Uh, most groups chose this question and most groups said no, it does not make sense because sex is not just about mixing blood. It's about a lot of other things as well. Um, but one group thought that it, th it did make sense because in this poem, it's uh, the concern is with virginity and like um, in those days, sex is usually not mainly for fun, but also for uh, producing children. So in those days, the idea of blood is more connected with sex. Uh, so in this sense, if the key idea in sex is the mixing of blood, then yes, this comparison does make sense in a way. But most people still think it's not very logical. Um, but if it does make sense, does the speaker say near the end of the poem that in fact it does not make sense? So in other words, does the speaker contradict himself? Is he saying two different things? So let's keep looking. So the first stanza, this is the main idea. Second stanza, oh stay, stay means stop. Three lives in one flea spare. Spare three lives in this one flea. So don't kill the flea. If you kill the flea, you, you're killing the flea and me and you because our blood is inside the flea. Where we almost, nay, nay means no, more than married are. So he says, it's like we're married. No, we already are married inside this flea. This flea is you and I, and this our marriage bed and marriage temple is. Uh, end of line 14, we are met, we are together and cloistered in these living walls of jet. Jet just means black. So like inside this flea, we are already together. Though use make you apt to kill me. So even if you wanted to reject me, and therefore like break my heart and, and kill me. It's exaggerated. You didn't quote on 
Let not to that self murder added be. So, okay, you want to kill me, kill me, but don't kill yourself. And sacrilege, three sins in killing three. Sacrilege because he says it's the marriage temple. So if you destroy the flea, you're destroying the temple. So it's sacrilege. So if you kill the flea, you kill the flea, you kill me, you kill you, and you are doing sacrilege. But the third stanza, Cruel and sudden hast thou since purpled thy nail in blood of innocence. So the addressee has killed the flea. Purple is here the color of the blood. Um, and then line 23, thou triumphs, you, you think you have won, and says that thou finds not thyself nor me the weaker now. You think you have won because you killed the flea, I said it would kill us, but you're still alive and healthy, so you think you have won. 25, tis true, you're right. Then learn how false fears be. From this, you can notice how you did not have to be afraid. Afraid of what? Next line, just so much honor when thou yields to me will waste as this flea's death took life from thee. This is a comparison. It's comparing two things. First thing, if you give yourself to me, the amount of honor that you will lose. This is the first thing. The second thing, how much life you would lose when the flea dies. Because, you know, uh, the speaker said, if you kill the flea, you're killing yourself. But after killing the flea, she's fine. So he's saying, you didn't lose any life from killing the flea, just like you would lose lo no honor if you sleep with me. So is the speaker saying that his sensual conceit about the flea and marriage was all bullshit? Yes. It's very opportunistic. Right? When the flea is alive, look at this flea. It is our love. When the flea is dead, look at this flea. It doesn't matter. OK, question two. What is the speaker's goal? He wants her to have sex with him. Why do you think the speaker will succeed or not? Most groups who took this question said the speaker will not succeed, mainly because he contradicts himself. Like if somebody walks up to you and makes a crazy argument. At first you'll think that's crazy, but if the person continues to give reasons, then slowly you might start to think, wait, maybe the person really believes this. But if in the middle the person gives the opposite argument, you know that they're bullshitting. So in this case, when the flea dies, the speaker changes his argument so most groups thought that the addressee would not be convinced. It's very obvious what the speaker wants to do, and the speaker is willing to sacrifice logic and reason to achieve his goal. However, it's possible that the speaker might succeed after all. Think about one of uh, Sir Philip Sidney's sonnets, the one about kissing the girl to shut her up. It's flirting, right? It's joking. It's fun. It's not meant to be a serious argument. In this poem, even though it's longer and it's more detailed and some people think it's kind of gross, but when the situation changes, the speaker changes his strategy. That could be a sign that he's not serious. Maybe he's also just flirting and having fun. And, you know, maybe the addressee would not think about the logic, but instead think about the person uh, making the argument. Maybe the person would look like a more fun and uh, entertaining person. So maybe he would succeed. It depends on who the addressee is. A lot of the group said his lover, his girlfriend. It's also possible they don't know each other. They're strangers. Uh, in this case, they would both be at court. Those are gongking renshi, so they would know who each other is, uh, but th maybe they don't know each other very well. It depends. 
Uh, but I think it's it's uh, clear to say that it's not his girlfriend. If it's his girlfriend, he doesn't have to try so hard to convince her. And three, nobody took nobody took any of the other questions. So these are all my questions. Three, why do you think the flea is structured as it is? So we talked about the three stanzas. The first stanza is the idea. The second stanza is don't kill the flea. The third stanza is, oh no, you killed the flea, but it's fine. But what about these indented lines? This so is easy. So this part is explaining the main idea. But starting in line seven, it says this enjoys before it woo. Uh, and alas, this is more than we would do. So here the speaker is connecting this idea to the relationship between him and the addressee. Second stanza, again, the main idea, this flea is our marriage bed and marriage temple. But in line 16, you want to kill the flea, please don't kill the flea. Uh, and it's explaining what would happen if she killed the flea. So it seems like uh, the last three lines are connecting the imagery to the relationship. What about the last stanza? Also, this part is about the idea of what happened after you killed the flea. And then the last three lines, changing strategies, trying another way to convince her. So it seems like the last three lines connected to their relationship. It's a good way to tell the reader that the focus or the perspective has changed. Question four, the second poem. Did you guys read the second poem? It's a very good poem, A Valediction for Bidding Morning. This is a really great poem. So valediction means goodbye. So if we translate the title, it means I need to go away, don't be sad. Um, and like the poem is full of imagery that tries to convince the addressee not to be sad that we have to part. Um, we usually say that the most powerful image is um, Oh no, okay, so I'll give you this page uh, in the future, but in the second page of this poem, there is an image of a compass, Rengui, and the idea is when you draw a circle, one leg of the compass stays still, and the other leg moves around, right? The speaker says, you are the middle, the, the middle leg. I am the leg that moves around. I can only draw a circle because you are still at home. And the further out I lean, uh, the more I depend on you. Like when I go out uh, and like the, the compass expands and goes flat, you also lean toward me. And you are, it's like you're drawing me back home. 就是人规那个你你画的人越大它不是长得越开然后就会越扁嘛它那个中间那只脚会越倾斜所以它就是说我们的关系就像是人规的两只脚我走的越远你越倾向我然后有你在中间才能把我带回家 Yeah, sorry about this. I didn't notice. I'll give you that page next week. Sorry about that. So like, yes, the flea is a bit more disgusting, but both poems use surprising imagery. Uh, so question five. 
Do you think his poems are philosophical? Not really. It's not really about philosophy. He's using philosophy to uh, try to affect the addressee or, or convince the addressee. Um, but it's not really about philosophy ideas. He's just using those ideas. In fact, we can we can look at Forbidding Morning, uh, the first page. As virtuous men pass mildly away, hao ren hao si, and whisper to their souls to go, while some of their sad friends do say the breath goes now, and some say no. So if you if your friend is lying on their bed and is about to die, you might think, oh, they they they've died. No, not yet. He's still breathing. No, he's died. Right? The breath goes now, and some say. No, so so means in this way. So let us melt and make no noise. No tear floods nor side tempests move. So this is traditional imagery. Tears compared to floods, sighing, tan qi, compared to tempest, bao feng yu. Toward profanation of our joys, and to tell the laity our love. Laity means people who believe in a religion but are not members of the church. Like they don't do any religious work. They just they're only believers. So here he's saying we should not let other people who are not part of our relationship see that we are sad that we have to part. Okay, so like the, the next two stanzas use a philosophy concept. Okay, so in the Middle Ages, they believed that the Earth was the middle of the universe and that there are like nine layers of heaven above the Earth. And the higher the layers, the less they move. And these are called the spheres. Um, so moving of the earth brings harms and fears. Here he's talking about like earthquakes. Men reckon what it did and meant. When it happens, people think why. But trepidation of the spheres, trepidation also means shaking, movement. Though greater far is innocent. So like the heavens don't move. When they do move, it's much more powerful, much more harmful, but we on earth don't feel it. We are innocent of that knowledge. So in the same way, dull sublunary lovers love, so ordinary people's love, whose soul is sense cannot admit absence because it doth remove those things which elemented it. So in the same way, we here uh, cannot think about moving away from each other because it is so powerful. So he's using philosophical imagery and ideas to to express the relationship and trying to comfort his lover. But it doesn't necessarily mean that he is a philosophical poet. Question five, how can you tell it was written in the 17th century? So. Going back to this, let's see. Um, so like in the flea, there's a lot of observations about this flea, right? It's black, it sucked blood, whatever. We can say that it's a kind of empiricism. Nobody before this ever thought that a flea is worth writing about, right? So this is newly paying attention to the world around them. The poem uses wit, ji zi, in this case, unusual ideas or unusual imagery to express familiar ideas. And colloquial language. Uh, I don't know if you can tell, these poems are slightly easier to understand than the sonnets we have been reading so far. Yeah, so most of these two. If we read, um, 
the second poem and we think about the compass, Rengue. When would you need a compass? When you're traveling far away and you have a map. So this is also connected to overseas travel, right? First colony, East India Company. It, it's a sign that England is expanding beyond its own land. Those are the three main ones. OK, uh, do you have questions? Right, so next week. I am very sorry about this, but you're going to read an essay from the 18th century. And um, essays are actually harder to read in terms of the grammar. Um, because in those days, people like to write really long sentences full of relative clauses. Uh, so it could be harder to understand. Um, but I, I really could not choose something else to represent the 18th century. This essay, like if, if next week we look at question six and you're like, how can you tell this essay was written in the 18th century? Basically, every single idea appears in that essay. It's very representative. So I really could not choose something else. Uh, also, the 18th century is the beginning of like adventure literature and like the novel. So a lot of the other important literature is just very, very long. Um, so I also tried to choose a short one. A modest proposal by Jonathan Swift. And the main idea appears under the title, right? For preventing the children of poor people in Ireland from being a burden to their parents or country and for making them beneficial to the public. That's what this essay is about. Supposedly. Um, so. Jonathan Swift is from a British family that lived in Ireland. He has had very close connections with Ireland. He grew up in Ireland. People thought of him as Irish. So it's natural for him to want to write this kind of essay. However, you should know that this is satire. It's not a serious proposal. And you can tell it's not serious because what is his solution? Let me give you a, a, an outline. So the first paragraph is about uh, the problem that everybody can see, which is so many poor Irish children. The second paragraph is how everybody agrees this is a problem and it's serious and we have to solve this problem. The third paragraph says, I, I want to do more than just solve this problem. I want to turn this problem into an advantage. As it says under the title, right? Turn it into something beneficial to the public. The next paragraph explains why he himself, uh, why he thinks that the other solutions don't make sense. Sorry, uh, this paragraph is about yeah, why the other solutions don't make sense, and this is how he came up with his own solution. Next paragraph is about uh, other benefits from his plan besides solving the problem. This paragraph is He's actually starting to explain his solution. This paragraph is about the number of poor Irish people and poor Irish children. And he needs to tell you these numbers so that he can later explain how his solution will deal with all of these people. And then finally. The next paragraph between pages 13 and 14 are his solution. I'm going to read it to you because this is the key point. This is where the reader finally discovers that this is not a serious essay. I am assured by our merchants, Sangren, that a boy or a girl before 12 years old is no saleable commodity. And even when they come to this age, they will not yield above yield means produce, 不会生产, above three pounds 
or three pounds and half a crown at most on the exchange. 真要卖的话，赚不了多少钱。Which cannot turn to account either to the parents or the kingdom the charge of nutriment and rags having been at least four times that value. 以这个价钱卖的话，不符成本。I shall now therefore humbly propose my own thoughts, which I hope will not be liable to the least objection. 希望大家不会反对。I have been assured by a very knowing American of my acquaintance in London, so it's not his idea; it's some American guy's idea, that a young, healthy child, well nursed, 养育很好的话 is at a year old a most delicious, nourishing, and wholesome food, whether stewed, 炖煮 roasted, 烤 baked, 烘 or boiled, 水煮 And I make no doubt that it will equally serve in a fricassee or a ragout. 还可以做多种菜色 So his solution to all of the poor children of Ireland is to eat them. So you can have fun with this essay. It's not too long. It's like five or six pages. Okay.、Um, and now. I'm going to introduce you to the Romantic period, which is the period after the 18th century.、Uh, again, I have to introduce this early because maybe next week we have to do the EPT. The date has not been announced yet. Okay, so the Romantic period, if you remember, the 18th century ended when Samuel Johnson died in 1784. So we say that the Romantic period begins in 1785. In this period, it's very short, 1785 to 1821. It is the shortest literary period, but it is very, very important. What happens? The Industrial Revolution, 工业革命 Connected to this is the idea of enclosure, 圈地运动 So in this period, landowners started to wall off their land. Previously. A landowner would、uh, like rent out their land to farmers, but there would be a part of the land where everybody could farm and use and share resources. Starting in this period, enclosure is when the landowner took out that part of the land and also divided that. So now the farmers had no extra land to share. If their own farming does not go well, if there's a drought or something bad happens, they don't have extra food. They don't have extra money,、um, so it becomes harder to be a farmer. So if you can't be a farmer, what do you do? Well, fortunately for you, there is this thing called the Industrial Revolution, and cities now need more people to work in factories. So if you you can't live from farming, you can go to the nearest city to find work. And so both of these things are connected. The enclosure movement added to the industrial revolution,、um, but the industrial revolution was actually like a really terrible time for workers. Today, if you get a job, you have protection from the government.、Uh, your boss cannot abuse you. You cannot work too long, too many hours. At the beginning of the industrial revolution, there were no protections. No youngest working age, no longest working hours, no safety regulations, no minimum pay, 最低薪资 nothing. So basically,、uh, so many poor people went to the cities to try to live and ended up starving anyway, or they dug for coal, 挖矿 and died from like lung disease, 肺炎肺结核 or they worked in the factories and they got hurt by the machines. Or little kids, six to eight years old, went to clean chimneys, 去清烟囱 and also died from lung disease. It's just a terrible time to be、uh, a poor person in the city. But because farming became harder, more people could not live in the countryside either. So you know, it's bad to be poor in the city. It's bad to be poor in the country. What do you do? Revolution. So this is why this is the era of revolutions. 1789 is the French Revolution, beginning in 1789. 
So if you remember history, uh, people rose up, toppled the king, cut off his head, and then they formed a government led by ordinary people. But it became an absolutist government, and then it led to the, the French terror, uh, and so some people thought, you know, this is not a good idea either. Didn't we say we wanted uh, like a, a better government? So they uh, started supporting somebody with more power to change things. This person is Napoleon. Napoleon started out in the army as an artillery man. Uh, and he slowly gained the support of the people. And finally, he overthrew the absolutist revolutionary government to form the French Empire. So he was crowned emperor in 1804. So this is what is happening inside France. Around France, everybody was scared because France was the first country to cut off the, the head of its king in order to form a different kind of government. Uh, so everybody was scared, right? If they could do that in France, like what's stopping them from doing that in Germany or, you know, in Prussia or even in England? So when this French Revolution happened and then Napoleon became emperor, basically he started fighting a war with the rest of Europe. Everybody came together to try to fight him and everyone kept losing. Because <laughs> Napoleon was a brilliant military commander. They kept fighting him until like 18, I think it was 1813. And they finally beat him the first time. Uh, and they locked him up in an, a prison, but he escaped. And he regrouped his army and kept fighting. And they finally defeated him in 1815 at the Battle of Waterloo, Hua Tielu Zi. So Napoleon terrorized Europe for 10 years. Now, England is across the English Channel, so it was not that scary, but people were still afraid. Napoleon was also a pretty good naval commander. So during this period, England was fighting a naval war against France. And in some of the literature, you can see that part of the history up here. Now, you might be thinking, wait, what about the American Revolution? We mentioned it last time, but why aren't we talking about it here? And this is because the American Revolution is not actually about the Industrial Revolution. It's not about poor people. It's not about people who are being oppressed and can't live anymore. The American Revolution is about uh, the middle class and rich landowners of North America did not want to pay taxes to the king. So it's actually a kind of revolution between nobles. Very different from the French Revolution. So this is the historical background. This is what's going on. How did that affect literature? In 1798, William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge published their book of poems called Lyrical Ballads. I think this is called Yong Wu Shi, Yong Wu Duan Shi, something like that. Uh, launching the movement known as Romanticism, Mang Man Yi. This is probably the most important poetry collection in British literary history. The poems themselves, they're okay. They're not like very good poems, but it's a completely new idea, a new way of thinking about poetry. Let's think about the poetry we have been reading so far. Some guy falls in love with some girl, tries to convince her to have sex with him. Some guy is in a contest and he sees the woman he loves and therefore wins the contest. Some guy has to leave his lover to go on business, and everybody is very sad. It seems kind of similar, right? But in Romanticism, Wordsworth and Coleridge say, you should be able to write poetry about anything. The key point is, as it says here, uh, the original quote is, 
the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings recollected in tranquility, which in like simple English is individual spontaneous feelings remembered afterward. So the point of poetry, according to these two poets, is not about love or grand ideas. It is about feelings. Any kind of powerful feelings afterwards, you can reflect back, think about those feelings and turn that into poetry. So now poetry is not just about what people do at court. It's about anything that happens in daily life. And for these two poets, the thing they like to write about is nature. So this is why romanticism is often connected with nature poetry. Poems about like the forest and the stream, Xiliu, and the sky and the flowers, these kinds of things. And it's no longer about sonnets. Now it's any kind of lyric poetry, Duan Shi Yong Wu Shi. The form has been opened up. In the in the past, sonnets had to be 14 lines, or like uh, today we looked at John Donne. He also uses the arrangement of lines in a specific way. But in lyric poetry, you can arrange the lines however you want to. There should be some kind of pattern, but the pattern does not have to be a traditional pattern. You can open up and be more creative with the form. Now, it says here meditations on nature, not just talking about nature, but thinking about nature. And this is why sometimes romantic poetry is a bit harder to understand because they're not just saying, oh, the flowers are pretty, the sky is pretty. It's saying the flowers in the sky help me get through life when I feel very sad. Or like after going to work in a factory and I need to recharge and re-energize myself, I can go through nature and feel the healing spirit of nature. It's a bit more philosophy. So in this period, the literature is more focused on everyday life and also the supernatural. If you think about nature as energy, as a, a source of healing, that's not exactly physics, right? That's a bit more than physics. So there's also a concern with the supernatural. And then finally with Gothic. So we mentioned Gothic novels in the... Uh, did we mention Gothic novels? No, okay. So what is the Gothic? The Gothic is like an early form of horror. Uh, but instead of like making you like jump because you're scared, it makes you afraid to look around the corner. So a typical Gothic novel would go something like um, a young woman has been abandoned by her lover and her family send her to a nunnery, Shodarin, high somewhere in the mountains, in the forest, in a very like remote place. And then the family leaves her there. But then slowly she realizes that this place is not very normal. The nuns are very weird. The leader is very weird. And then one night in, during a thunderstorm, she discovers that everybody is having crazy sinful sex. And she tries to run away, but they trap her and lock her somewhere. You know, that kind of story. So it's like a horror romance, Qing San Se, that kind of story. Very, very, very popular. Um, so in this era, you have these two kinds of literature, nature and philosophy and like violence and sex. Um, and in this period, uh, in the 18th century, we talked about the public sphere, people, more people learned to read, uh, more people started understanding what's going on in society and started enjoying literature. In this period, the public itself is, becomes very important. What the people think is very important. Remember, England is at this point, England is not a democracy. So this is a very uh, new and important development. What the people think is very important. And one reason is, of course, because of the French Revolution across the ocean or across the English Channel. Um, so in this uh, environment, people wrote literature not just for like the middle class and the upper class. They wrote literature for everybody. 
that's why we have the gothic novel, right? That's for the ordinary people who just want to have fun while they read something. But so we also have popular criticism. Now it's not just writing about ideas and issues. It's also writing about literature. In this period, what people think about literary works is also very important. Uh, we're going to talk about the poet John Keats a bit later. They say that Keats died because he got a bad review of his poem. That's how important criticism is in this period. And also you have the personal essay. So as I said, you can write about anything. So people started writing about their daily life. In the past, the essay is about ideas. Here it's about personal experience, personal feelings, and personal ideas, not necessarily like philosophy. This is also the period where the novel becomes modern. In the past, we had long works that people think is a kind of novel. But in, in the Romantic period, uh, basically Jane Austen develops what we think of today as the modern novel. So Pride and Prejudice, right? All my opinion. Uh, in 1813. Jane Austen, uh, she focuses more on what we call perspective. When you read a story, whose perspective is this story being told from? What can we see and learn, and what can we not see and learn? This is something that Austin thought about very much, and her novels slowly present uh, a more sophisticated way of dealing with this question. Uh, next semester, I'm offering a course called Important British Writers' Works. We're going to read a Jane Austen novel, not Pride and Prejudice, because it's a terrible novel. Also, in 1818, we have Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, 科学怪人, is also a novel. Many people think this is the first science fiction novel in English. Uh, if you don't know, uh, Victor Frankenstein tries to give life to a dead person. Sorry, Victor Frankenstein tries to create life, and he does this by going to graveyards, stealing body parts, putting the body parts together, and then electrifying them. And he succeeds, and he creates a monster made up of other dead people. The main part of this story, this is the part of the story that most people remember, but actually the main part of this story is the monster keeps asking himself, who am I? Am I a person? Do I belong here? Do I belong to God? Or am I like uh, completely evil and made by the devil? And lots of like thinking about identity and philosophy. And finally, he has to fight the town, uh, the, the people of the village around uh, Frankenstein's castle, because they all think he's an unholy creation. Um, yeah, I can say more about this, but we're running out of time. 1800, the Acts of Union annex Ireland to form the United Kingdom. So, as I mentioned, British literary history is very connected with Ireland. Uh, last time we noted that in the 18th century, um, Oliver Cromwell had to fight King James all the way to Ireland before finally defeating him. Uh, and Ireland had many British landowners. Many rich British people uh, went there on vacation uh, to, to make money from farming, that kind of thing. But in 1800, Ireland is formally now part of the UK. And uh, even though it's formally part of the country, England still treats it as a colony. So, why did they annex Ireland with Mapping Twin? Because it's easier to manage, not because they think Ireland is now an equal part of the country. Uh, and that's one reason why uh, we are reading Jonathan Swift's essay about poor Irish people. 1819, the Peterloo Massacre. This 
was when the British government killed hundreds of protesting workers. We talked about the Industrial Revolution, poor working conditions, uh, and when the workers came together to protest, the government basically killed everybody. Uh, and this is the start of like ordinary people realizing that they can't trust the government and that they have to fight for their own rights. But it's also the beginning of the idea that uh, fighting for your rights might not always work and that people will die uh, before you succeed, even uh, if you even do succeed at all. It's a major event in British working history, uh, and it led to some reforms in the next literary period. Uh, and the period ends with the death of John Keats. John Keats is often considered the most beautiful poet in English. Debatable. I don't exactly agree. And we're not going to read his poems because apparently they're not very easy to read. I tried assigning them once and uh, nobody could understand what Keats is saying. So uh, we're not going to try. Um, but you should know that he is also part of romantic poetry. Romanticism was started by Wordsworth, Wazuhasi, and Coleridge, but it also included some other poets like uh, Lord Byron, Bai Lun, uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley, Xue Lai, and John Keats, Ji Ci. Uh, we're going to read, uh, and also like uh, before Wordsworth and Coleridge, there is a poet called William Blake. People sometimes also think of him as a romanticist, Blake. So during the Romantic period, we're going to read Blake and Wordsworth. Uh, Blake because he's easy to understand, Wordsworth because he's not so easy to understand, but he's too important. We do have to read some of his work. Okay, questions about the Romantic period? Laman Juyi OK, so uh, for next week, please read a modest proposal and you can use my discussion questions to help guide you. OK, see you next week.